Welcome everyone. I am Margot Crawford. I'm a professor of English here at the University of Pennsylvania and I am also the director of the Center for Africana Studies and I am truly delighted uh, about our conversation, so excited about our conversation today. This conversation is a part of the Center's Faculty Research Colloquium and this colloquium aims to put a spotlight on the emergent and most vibrant zones of Black studies. And let me introduce our speakers. Simone White is Assistant Professor of English here at University of Pennsylvania. She is the recipient of a 2017 Whiting Award for Poetry. Simone White is the author of three collections, Dear Angel of Death, 2018, Of Being Dispersed, 2016, and House of Envy of All the World, published in 2010. She is also the author of the poetry chapbook, Unrest, published in 2013, and the collaborative poem painting chapbook, Dolly, published in 2008 with Kim Thomas. Her poetry and prose have been featured in publications such as Harper's Magazine, Bomb Magazine, Chicago Review, and Harriet the Blog. Tina Camp is Owen F. Walker, Professor of Humanities and Modern Culture and Media at Brown University. Camp is a Black feminist theorist of visual culture and contemporary art. One of the founding researchers in Black European studies, her early work theorized gender, racial, and diasporic formation in Black communities in Europe, focusing on the role of vernacular photography and processes of historical interpretation. Her books include other Germans, Black Germans, and the Politics of Race, Gender, and Memory in the Third Reich, 2004. Image Matters, Archive, Photography, and the African Diaspora in Europe, published in 2012. And Listening to Images, published in 2017. Our third speaker, Benjamin Krusling, is a poet and artist who works in text, sound, and image. He produces the radio program Black Secrets with artist Anais Duplan. He is author of a chapbook, Grapes, and his poetry collection, Glaring, will be coming out in December from Wendy's Subway. His writing has appeared in Hyper Allergic, The New Inquiry, Black Warrior Review, and other publications. Today, our speakers are thinking about frequency. And without any more delay, let us now enter into the frequency of all of the electricity I'm sure this conversation is going to create. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Um, as I said before, I need to introduce my dog who's barking like crazy in the background. Um, I switched to noise canceling headphones in hopes that it won't be quite so loud as it normally is. <laughs> but can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so we had decided that I should go first. Should I just launch? Or do you? Okay. Um, so first of all, I, I need to thank Margo for the lovely introduction and Simone for the invitation to participate in this wonderful forum. Um, when she asked me to be in conversation with her, I was excited because I love thinking with her. <laughs> and also because it's a wonderful opportunity to continue a conversation that we started in the spring of this year. Um, and that conversation was on the idea of frequency, which we have um, different understandings of, but those understandings are really in conversation. Um, and so what, what she's asked me to do is to basically present briefly and relatively informally um, what the concept of frequency is that is most valuable to me. And then after that, we're going to be staging a kind of, what did you say? How did you describe it? A kind of, why did you, what did you call it, Simone? <laughs> I called it a kind of demonstration, but... Um... <laughs> It's a, a demonstration on two tracks. That's yeah. kind of what it is, two or three tracks. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, so this is track one. Um, so um, I began thinking about visual frequency uh, a little while ago, a couple of years ago. And that was initially in relationship to Arthur Jaffa's work. Um, but more recently, I've really come to explore a much more expansive 
way of understanding the concept of frequency, mostly actually um, by way of teaching uh, a grad seminar last semester. Uh, in the spring semester called The Visual Frequency of Black Life, um, which I taught together with Saidiya Hartman, which was really a, a wonderful opportunity to think again expansively about a term that I had started thinking about in more relatively limited terms. And I've also been uh, fortunate enough to um, be thinking, be able to think it further in dialogue with artists, um, most recently with the artists Jen and Kiro and Zara Julius, and with theorist Alex Oyalea as part of a project called the Sojourner Project, which I um, am one of the co-conveners of, and which hosted a listening session this past Friday called Frequencies of Blackness. Um, and the listening session was really just that, and I want to share some of uh, the comments that I made there. Um, it was really about listening to uh, different ways of conceptualizing frequency in relationship to Black life, Black futurity, and Black possibility. And I think that the description um, of the session is useful for understanding what I find most generative about the concept of frequency. And I'm just going to read a short bit of that. Um, what does frequency offer us as a framework for understanding Black life? What insights does it provide for responding to anti-Blackness? And how might it help us to see, heal, and feel the power of Black life's irrepressible drive towards creating a different kind of futurity. At a moment of transnational racial reckoning, this listening session, or the one on Friday, um, was intended to explore Black frequency as a site of possibility. It engaged Black frequency in multiple forms, as a sonic space that ranges from silence to deafening dissonant noise, as a register of rapture and spirituality, as a temporal feedback loop of memory, repetition, and renewal, as a dynamic relation of call and response or chorus and verse, and as a haptic and kinetic space of contact and connection across the African continent and its various diasporas. <clears throat> so that's sort of a teaser of how I'm beginning to sort of expand the notion of frequency that I started out writing about a couple of years ago. Um, and just to sort of draw a line to that, um, my original work um, was focused on um, the effective and multi-sensory accounts of the work of images um, and photography in particular in theorizing gendered, racial, sexual, and diasporic formation among Black communities. Um, and when I started this work, I was using the concept of visual frequency or the visual frequency of images as my way of describing how images move us, how they impact us and affect us and the kinds of impressions that they leave on us beyond simply looking at them. Um, and it's this understanding of frequency that led me to think about how frequency might allow us to access new ways of capturing and articulating practices of refusal, futurity, and possibility in African diasporic communities. So my original concept of frequency was shaped by uh, just one specific idea of frequency, um, which is frequency as a sonic register, um, or you know, in really fundamental definitional terms as a way of calculating the rate of vibration of sound waves moving through the air. And here again, I become a science geek. There is no other part of my life where I'm a science geek except when it's around frequency. Um, and so that was my first way of understanding frequency is as sonic vibration, right? So sonic, uh, that, that frequency is a register of sound that is calibrating the vibrations that produce it. Um, but I've come to move beyond that, not necessarily leaving it behind, but augmenting it with other um, registers of frequency. Um, and for me, the most important one that connects sound to the other ones is by understanding frequency as first and foremost of being about movement. Um, and when I say that, I mean movement in two directions, movement as being moved and movement as setting things in motion. 
and those two things together. So when I say it's about being moved, I, I'm talking about it as being effective or us being affected by it, impacted or being moved to feel or moved to feelings. And when I say it's about setting things into motion, here again, I'm talking about physical motion um, and the geek comes back, right? Which is how slow or quickly molecules, molecules vibrate. So again, it is, when I talk about frequency, it is fundamentally about vibration, right? But not simply sonic vibration, right? So if vibration is about movement, there are multiple forms of movement that I want to use the term frequency for us to understand. Um, and so that duality of, um, of frequency being about being moved and setting into physical motion means that I'm talking about frequency as haptic, right? Being about touch and feeling and about kinesis, being about motion and movement. Um, so, Again, trying to, again, expand and augment this sort of baseline notion of sonic frequency with a haptic dimension and a kinetic dimension, it also has a visual dimension, um, which to me, again, goes back to this fundamental notion of frequency, which counts not just for sound waves, but for any waves, which includes light waves, right? So frequency is also a calibration of the movement of light. Um, along a similar scale as the sonic, which is from the visible to that which we can't necessarily see um, or is not necessarily visible to the human eye. So in the same way that sound has an entire bandwidth of frequencies, some of which are audible to human ears, but many of which are not. Similarly, light has a, 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 an, an analogous set of bandwidths, right? Um, and so in that way, um, I'm thinking about frequency um, as a form of visuality that has different levels of, of illumination that range from the visible to the invisible. And that to me, attending to frequency in the visual realm is attuning ourselves to see differently and make things visible that others might want to erase. Um, and so to this other, again, augmenting again, adding again, um, frequency is also to me about this other baseline definition of time and temporality, right? Because frequency is in sort of normal everyday parlance about how things, how often things occur over time, right? How frequently something happens. Right? So when I'm thinking about the temporality of frequency, I'm also talking about a relationship to time, history, and memory. And again, thinking about those waves to think about attending to the cycles of history, how, what it means to return to them and what does it mean to interrupt them, right? So the sort of compound, <laughs> compound levels of frequency that I'm trying to describe are, is a way of understanding frequency as at once sonic, it registers as sound in pitches, temporal, it recurs over time in intervals, kinetic, it is constituted by movement or vibration, haptic, it's a mode of contact that we feel, and that affects us and visual, right? As a range of that which is visible or should be and can be or must be made visible, right? So to return to the question that was posed in that description that I read to you of the listening session, what does frequency help us to see, hear and feel, right? And how does it help us um, encounter uh, the power of Black lives irrepressible drive towards a different kind of futurity, right? I'm trying to, to get, or my goal is to use the concept of frequency to make us more aware of the ways in which we can make visible or attend to these different forces um, in Black life that are up against all odds still moving toward 
a different kind of possibility or a different kind of futurity. So the place that I've been um, really sort of immersing myself as in order to try and, you know, see how far I can push the idea of frequency um, and black life is in the work of um, black contemporary artists. And most recently, and I would say I've been sort of obsessed with this over the last, I'd say four to six months, is looking at um, a particular film um, by Theaster Gates called Dance of Malaga, um, which to me really does enact all of these different aspects of black frequency. Um, and I screened it last week during the, uh, during the listening session, um, but um, we don't have time because we're doing our two tracks and I wanna keep enough time for the second track in play. Um, but I've just sort of talked to you about how I'm seeing, reading, hearing, feeling uh, frequency in this really splendid work. Um, so, what the film does, or what Gates does in the creation of this artwork, um, is to use low frequential tones to create what I call a sonic requiem for a mixed race black community that was forced to leave the island of Malaga off the coast of Maine, where they had lived in safety and shelter um, from the racism of mainland United States up and for the for 50 years up until 1912. So they were a community of multiple families, uh, mixed race families, who ended up there, they're, one of their uh, early ancestors had purchased some land there and was given some land there um, uh, by uh, uh, a, a landowner. And he basically migrated a number of different families there who were related to him. But in uh, the early 20th century, once the, the state of Maine got wind of their residents there, they on the one hand decided they needed to educate them by, and built a school there um, in order to do that. But on the other hand, by the time that started to um, draw more attention to this community, uh, the flip side came. Right, which is that um, the governor of Maine uh, decided that these, this community was basically an abject aberration against you know, the politics of racial purity of that particular moment and demanded that they leave and evicted them from the island. Um, but what happened is that before government officials could get there to evict them, most of them left packed up all of their belongings, including their homes, it is rumored, um, and floated them south and left the island before anybody could come. So they, they created their own um, form of fugitivity and flight in order to create a new possibility for futurity elsewhere. Now, what's interesting to me about the way in which um, Gates portrays, and I'm not going to say narrates because he doesn't narrate this story, and actually what he does is he animates it, is he animates it not so much visually, although the visuals are stunning, um, but he animates them through sound, and he animates them through low frequential sounds that to him register, are intended to register as vibration and at the same time as the frequency of water because water was both what protected this community and at the same time was their mode of escape and flight, right? Um, and so one of the things that he describes is that the, the low level sound, the sonic registers that he's trying to play with throughout uh, the, the film is supposed to mimic a sound like you would hear it when you're underwater. Um, and there it's actually really interesting to think about the frequency of water because water does have a frequency and that's again, geeky Tina, um, which is to say that if frequency is literally the mode of movement, vibration, energy that happens when any material comes into contact with another, right? Then there is a transfer of energy. 
And so that is what, that is literally the definition of the resonant frequency of water, which is the rate of vibration at which energy transfer happens. Um, the other thing that's really interesting or I find super compelling about the way in which the Aster has talked about this film and the relationship between sound and water is that uh, sound, I'm sorry, water actually amplifies sound. Um, that we hear water, hear sound, I'm sorry, we hear sound in water louder than we do in air because the rate at which, the way in which it impacts us and which it penetrates us is that it penetrates us all at once instead of simply through one ear or another, which is also the reason that, um, that you can't locate sound, where sound is coming from in water. In any case, okay, reeling back the geek. Um, <laughs> so one of the things that I find truly captivating about, um, about the film is that he starts with this ambient sound of water. And then what happens is through images that weave both um, uh, a choreographic enactment of family and community relations among the Malagites. And that's also woven into archival footage of mixed race families, of the archive that, that was left behind or recovered in the soil of this community, of journalistic reports, of um, all sorts of different um, media that are reporting about, talking about this community. Um, the Black Monks, which is Gates's um, improvisational musical ensemble, um, they improvise a soundtrack that is to me about the, the call and response relationship between uh, the Malagites then that we have lost and calling them back into being now. So what I'm trying to say is that one of the things that I find is, or one of the ways in which I think it's important to um, understand this film is that it is creating both a sonic and a visual requiem that calls the community back into sight and sound, that calls its history back into sight and sound at a particular, a particularly complicated frequency. Um, so in that way, I feel like um, the film itself is a requiem of remembrance that's trying to disrupt the erasure of the community in history. Um, and it does this, again, on all of those levels that I'm trying to bring together in my understanding of frequency, which is visually, sonically, haptically, and kinetically by way of the frequency of water. So I'm gonna end there and shift to track number two. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tina. Um, everybody who's listening or watching can now understand why I invited Tina, <laughs> who is a great master of this conversation, to um, introduce it and also to explore some of its finer points in um, the materials that she's currently looking at. So I just, I'm gonna sit in the middle between Tina and Ben, kind of. I'm gonna try and sort of function in the way that I, I understand Tina to be explaining the ways in which materials actually communicate with one another. And I wanna go back to something she has written. She shared with me uh, some of her writing on um, uh, the Malaga film that, of Fiesta Gates. Will you please tell me the name of that film again? Because in my notes, it's just not written down. Will you just tell me the title again, Tina? Oh, you're muted. Dance of Malaga, yay. Yes, Dance of Malaga, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so this is your, these are your words. And then I'm gonna start talking and then then I'm just gonna prompt you to come in. I also wanna let people know that I'm gonna do my best to orchestrate this little um, dance. I don't know if it's gonna work. There's some audio involved um, and I'm gonna try and, and, and do it smoothly because it's not been rehearsed, okay? <laughs> okay? So this is Tina. Quote, frequency is at once sonic. It registers as sound and in pitches. Temporal, it recurs over time in intervals. Kinetic, 
It is constituted by movement or vibration at a range of velocities and intensities. Haptic, it is a mode of contact that we feel in and through our bodies and visual. It can be triggered through sight. And I wanna introduce this other term, which is a word that everybody knows is in common usage. And I don't wanna think of it in any other than its common usage, which is vibes. My work as a poet and a critic moves to describe the unsettled and contested conceptual world of people living today, black people living today, black women. I'm aware that my work in the professional discipline called critical theory, which is world defining work can undo my intention to loosen constraint, reduce the extent to which my life as a woman and other lives are lived primarily under the rubric of exclusion. I can harm myself and others when I misunderstand the world or the circulation of my statements. Paraontology, fugitivity, waywardness, death, aliveness, capital W world, futurity, resonance, frequency, entanglement. Many people are working the profound insights that Black Studies has offered to the project of thinking human existence beyond the category of the subject and subjectivation. Many people are urgently thinking the same thing at the same time. Just when I think I'm having a useful thought, it turns out someone else is having it too at exactly that moment, a little bit different. So we're witnessing an incredible moment of alignment in Black Studies where uh, we have a kind of paraontological turn that's joined up with an aesthetic turn. And these are related to one another insofar as we seem to have noticed that the, um, what Denise Ferreira da Silva calls modern representation has left us in a kind of bind where our expressions or representations of our identity as Black people has left us in a situation where we are performing a subjectivity which ultimately will lead us to exactly the same circuit of subjection. And we wanna celebrate this turn and recognize the ways in which we are sort of all living in it, this, this new information that we can begin to move away from the design of subjectivity in the subject but also I feel a little nervous about it. I feel like um, we have, you know, like all human beings, the tendency to preach to the choir. And so one of the things that I'm very interested in doing is learning one of the lessons of this turn, I think, which is a growing awareness of a kind of ethical neutrality and the non-exceptional nature of materials, including the human materials that are black human beings. That is, we are experiencing now a kind of black humanity that it is, is in helpless attunement to everything that is around us, none of which is directed towards liberation necessarily. I'm interested in taking this incredible insight and this energy in black studies and applying it to thinking very, um, very specifically and in a very uh, uh, practical way about how matter is playing us and how we are playing it. I'm interested in base waves, in synthesizers, in algorithms. I'm interested in how people come to know and offer themselves in relation to others by way of resonance. I want to read this strange little article, which is about um, the brain under the subtitle, All About the Vibrations. All things in our universe are constantly in motion, vibrating. Even objects that appear to be stationary are in fact vibrating, oscillating, resonating at various frequencies. Resonance is a type of motion characterized by oscillation between two states. And ultimately all matter is just vibrations of various underlying fields. At such, at every scale, all of nature vibrates. Examining resonance leads to potentially deep insights about the nature of consciousness and about the universe more generally. Well, this may be true, <laughs> but I'm actually interested in this very practical thing that Tina started to talk about towards the end of her, of her um, what can we call it? Um, discourse, just let's call it a discourse. Comments. <laughs> comments. 
I was trying to form a kind of question that would lead to um, the next thing I want to do, which is to share um, a, a piece of writing that Tina already knows, a poem called A, which comes out of um, my conversation with Ben Krusling, who's here, about Chief Keith and how we've been trying to understand how trap music alerts us to some of the sort of raggediness of materiality and vibration. Um, let me try to formulate that question, which I was just sort of jotting down. I would put it maybe something like this. What is the mechanism by which formations, right, formations of materials, of matter, which are lumped together, right, in, um, in, in little groups. Um, Deleuze and Guattari talk about uh, crazy quilts as one such formation, trap music is another. What is the mechanism by which formations might drive toward creating a different kind of futurity? That is, I wanna kind of stop in precisely the place where we are watching energies come into contact with one another as a matter of writing and think about how it is that we might have a new thought. That is, I wanna speak of the way I see an opening or possibility coming out of certain energy transfers. And if I can stand the meaninglessness of an experience of being in contact with another thing before it takes on the authority of concept, maybe we can have what we call new thoughts. And new thoughts doesn't mean new concepts or new explanations. We wanna lurk in the possibilities of language for describing or demonstrating an emotional situation that partakes of conditions that are both physical or material and social. This is sort of like sociogeny, maybe, maybe, but maybe it's not insofar as it really doesn't have a trajectory. It is a uh, much messier uh, situation than that because we are talking about an explosion. Um, let's, with that, I'm going to read a small section of this poem called A. It's long, so, and I want to give Ben most of the time. I'm going to share my screen as I read because I want you to be able to hear some of what Ben and I were working with. I'm going to do that now. I'm not going to talk a lot about Chief Keep. We're just going to leave that for later, but I want to introduce him a little by way of his own sound. imagine air disaster, mass death and my own death to be related to a kind of unresourcefulness or lack of creativity with respect to language, or language's pathetic nature in the face of dimensions. What to call flayed vest vestibularity, which sounds very dramatic. Chief Keefe's save me, for example. If Chief Keefe has Asperger's, I'll be a monkey's uncle. Two kinds of multidimensional multi imagining have been troubling during the time of this work. I misunderstand grinning for granny, warring for want wreck. It doesn't matter. After all, if looking at a painting or listening to music that doesn't have words, I misunderstand. It's considered a function of excess of interpretability, works having vectors, operational vibrations outside their physical presentation and common understanding, not only Black people's theoretical proposals. By virtue of being in proximity to my peculiarity, the speech of another, what comes out of the body of another now? More likely a long time ago, then almost dying there, until it is activated when I come to it. That is, the things that actually die that we make perhaps going wrong. I'm gonna play uh, just a little bit of this 
section of a song called War, which was the thing I asked Ben to respond to initially in our conversation about this music. And after that, um, I think Ben, you can just read. Um, I do wanna say though, that Ben, who will introduce himself as a poet, you know, who is an artist who works in text, sound and image, unlike me who refuses to give up the sole designation of poet. I think this speaks to a certain kind of generational understanding that is precisely what we're talking about here today. Um, I wanna play this and then Ben, you're on. War. Drill rings true to the depressive, boring as in piercing and turning. Dope got me coffin, thought I was gonna end up in a coffin. If you could call that drilling, martial engagement, black dynamism extremity. Well, it's how I'd be feeling sometimes, forgetting what other than survival I was thinking about, but every day not warring in that sense waking up and beginning the task of applying semiotic pressure, hacking, wheezing as prelude to clarity of purpose. Chief Keefe doesn't historicize his condition. So Ram says, but pure present and always tense. The judge is the more serious antagonism. He can only turn his mind against the sentence. For example, I don't want to have to go to jail and she misunderstands what he means by everything he does. And I don't want to have to get exploited to quote, make a living or make a living full faced. There's an emotional stake in the truth either way or see myself as a thousand rubber bands of experience around childhood with the dirt and blood of learning in my eyes and mouth and bouncing with the bass vibrating the frame of the Jetta with steel pulse diggable planets all memory and reanimated by brain power. Too short, slick Rick, mob deep, hell on earth. I don't love the film of sentimentality over it. War in that sense, we're in it, running in New York, Chicago, everywhere with a mayor and Trump tower, the condition of being held hostage, the world is owned, consciousness at war with the given, end quote, black noise re-racialized, it's gothic and rattling. In the end, I'm sad, but not just. Blood running, flying, an argument for escalation. The cost, a bag and a head, guns drumming and counting. Immature in the sense that experience is impervious to it. In the womb of the song where noise makes matter happen. But we like friction over here. We lay down words about it to say, Childhood is expensive, and then uncles in prison, commas, commas, or be a parasite, not to do it, to change everything on my ID. And it's a manner of singing that isn't crooning, flexing, not at the gym, go to jail, slow as a coffle. It's a sound that blows the speakers out of smartphone. My amniotic listening, I've said that, but then I think myself, escalating a situation to the point of decisive action, right or wrong, 
thinking how my enemy doesn't want it with me. I've felt that, then sometimes make a calculation, a solid rhyme, all synthetic drum and horn, alive with low fidelity, precarious production and performance. Time and space can't be taken for granted. We like friction over here, whether or not he's telling you what he just did. War is an argument for action and flight, like blowing New Jersey up, which on some days we agree on, and my own heroic self-preservation and destruction, childlike in the sense that experience is impervious to it. Childhood is expensive across a narrow abyss of misapprehension or whatever he said. I do sit down and quote, think, pinch and save, accosted by a cop at the movies. When people ask, do you think it was intentional? Of course, I willed it into being. In other words, he's corporeal. We're talking about presence, not a game, presence. So pain comes unshareably into our myths, end quote. What she said, words going, reverb calling into the far end of darkness, frozen, possessed, zombified, laboring in a group in the yard. What'd you touch that for is a good question in the middle of an utterance about what we don't want to do or happen. I'm melting into the song like a real listener. Ghouls march over the earth and I'm all alone now. Dreaming stops, punched in the head by the weather, lurching through a conjuration. Flexing no gym, getting gains not there. Believing actually in retaliation as a mode thinking of how life used to be. But we were talking about speech and hesitation, which is what I'm saying. I've got antennae out for blues in the womb of rhythm. After struggling to catch his breath, he tries to defeat the beat of war with an upward surge that serves partly as a reminder of war's ongoing intensities, boredoms, bursts. Rivals reappear in smoke and disrespect in the conditions of war rearticulated in the music. Fans telling stories about dead black children on Reddit. There's an outside to the music, but not when I'm in it. And not when I'm in the reds and grays of mild and hedonic descent. When Gothic makes sense, when death isn't in the scenes far distance. The future is evacuated. I push and save for extremity to the world's edge where all programs become unreadable. What the fuck, how the fuck, for example, what I'm saying with the sonorous voice and its frequencies, hypnotized by Sosa Chamberlain on a Saturday, back from the dead, but not zombie music, anxiety, high hats. This is Ram Emanuel's world and we're living in it. They censor the subjects they regret producing Obama killed thousands, but guess who can't perform in Chicago? Saw my uncle dead, cousin dead, brother dead, grandpa dead. He gone now, I can't get him back, end quote. What I'm trying to get to the middle of is this liminal love, this estuary of heat and blur, where my solid state is transformed by what this music puts in motion that isn't feeding, that isn't exhaustion. And I'll leave it there. I think that's how I want to enter my thinking about all of the above, but thank you. So much. Um, I play go to jail and not war, but I think I might be able to stop my share and let me see here. Let me see if I can hear that. You can hear the coughing, which is kind of interesting to hear. <laughs> No, it doesn't want to play it. That's fine. So I think we can open the floor for conversation and questions, both of each other and um, from those of you who I can't see who are um, out in the internet. So um, let me. I got to recover from listening to Ben. <laughs> so Tina's got a question. Yeah, um, so beautiful. Thank you. Um, I too am recovering. I have to, <laughs> I have to think of it. But 
there, there I have two questions though for um for Simone. And one of them is an old question that I just I really need to ask you. Um, I want to hear you talk about flayed vestibularity um, because it's it's a it's an amazing term, and I just want to hear you talk about that for a minute. And but the other thing is the reason I want to ask I want I'm asking you about it. It was has to do with the other um, question, which relates to the question that you formulated so incredibly beautifully. What is the mechanism by which formations might drive towards creating? new forms of futurity. Um, and the, the thing about that, the, the beauty of the way in which you formulated that is your emphasis, of, emphasis on mechanism. What is the mechanism? You don't ask, how do we do this? You actually say, we need to think about a mechanism, a tool, you know, a conduit, um, a mode of transformation. And then you also said the mechanism by which formations Right, might drive towards creating this new form of futurity. And so again, you're, you're talking about, you're not talking about a single instrument, you're talking about an assemblage of possibly practices, mm -hmm. right? That are realigning certain, again, formations, mm -hmm. certain gatherings and comings together um, towards creating new forms of futurity. And so the, the um, the way in which you're uh, urging us to think about um, assemblages and collectivities, um, to me, is almost like you're saying the mechanism is the formation, right? And the formation is the mechanism. Um, and I just thought that was really, I, I mean, I'm, I'm still thinking about it, but um, because I know how intentional you are in your language, um, I just had to sort of express something around that <laughs> also in relationship to flayed vestibularity. Um, well, so flayed vestibularity is, you know, is just like a little formation, which is composed of a couple of different conceptual problematics that come to us through Horton Spillers and other kinds of thinking about being torn apart um, and, and yet remaining whole. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then, um, and I guess I am interested in, in putting these two um, modes of, of working together. There's, you know, the sort of critical modality of thinking about what it would mean to be um, a, a human being who is fundamentally sort of identified as that which is torn apart, right, and remaining in the vestibule of um, the world. Mm -hmm. um, and how, what if, what if Chief Keith can be brought into a conversation about what that means? Part of the, my interest in trap music is this kind of impossibility of having a conversation about what it would mean to be in conversation with a person who is has not necessarily foregone the possibility of violence against you. This may actually be, for me, this um, isn't a stretch. Mm -hmm. It actually partakes of the real conditions of Black women in the world and part of my understanding of what it means to be here. Because I mean, and this is what like my new book project sort of deals in. It, it deals in um, an understanding of, of the self in the contemporary world, not in the historical one, um, as a person who must undergo daily a kind of um, gauntlet, right? Mm -hmm. of, um, of aggression or assaults or um, in order in order just to kind of like arrive on the scene. And, um, and the, the, the energy, right, or the source of identification and, and synchronicity that I feel with trap music, in my view, that I've come to understand, first, I was really confused as to my response to the music initially. 
I've been thinking about it for a long time now, you know, five or six years, just kind of constantly. And my initial response to it was a kind of like shock or confusion that I experienced as a kind of like linguistic blankness. And I talk about this a lot, but I've come recently to understand that that response is a response to a kind of fundamental denial of um, that I recognize in the music and that speaks to me, you know, mm. through it, through its sonic situation, right, which is not random in any respect, right, is a, is a, collect, a collection and amalgamation of various signals, right. This is a gigantic corporate music which is designed to reach us and it does. Mm -hmm. And so those signals, it seems to me, do speak to a kind of, you know, recognizable denial of, 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 of um, the demand for human respect that I like vibe to. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, that is, that's been what I'm working with at the end of project, you know, just like it took a very long time <laughs> to be able to articulate um, the, the feeling of sameness, right? This, the sense in which we might be linked. Right. And, and these final poems and the work with Ben also, right? Trying to talk to someone else about it um, has been an important part of trying to sort of get there. I really, I really appreciate you saying that because what you're naming is this predicament, right? It's this predicament of being captured in a form of negation that is supposed to annihilate you, but in fact, you feel, you recognize it, right? And, and what does it mean to embrace that recognition, mm -hmm. right, in spite of the kind of mirroring of negations, <laughs> you know? And so I mean, that is a feat, that is a predicament, right? <laughs> when what we're, we're, you know, are trained to do or supposed to be doing is distance, mm -hmm. right? But mm -hmm. to claim something beyond the distance, to complain, to, uh, to claim an affinity, right? With that negation. I mean, to me, that, that is the definition of fugitivity on some level, mm -hmm. right? Um, to claim that negation as generative of another kind of um, another form of recognition, in fact, you know, on some level. But it's an really, it's fascinating. Yeah, and it's an opportunity. Yes. Yeah. If you can survive it. <laughs> if you can survive it, right, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, the second part, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, how do I, how do I speak to the, I don't, I think that probably more will come. I'll continue thinking about the second part of your question about mechanisms, whether mechanism, mm -hmm. would that really, I'm going to keep listening. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I see something here in the Q&A. Let's see. Mm -hmm. From Dixon. Hi, Dixon. Um, Thanks so much for all these thoughts so far. I have a question open to everyone. What accounts for the body or the corporeal's movability in relationship to the kinds of frequencies found in trap? I have a sense of the kinds of energies, particularly as they have been shaped by conditions of blackness that we might hear or feel as a vibe, but curious on thoughts about how a body catches a vibe, a vibe being something different than frequency and its scientific explanation or how different bodies might catch or not catch a vibe? Huh. I mean, I'm, it's so, so the vibe is, for me, vibe is and isn't um, vibration or frequency, mm -hmm. right? It is and it isn't, right? It's both, um, it is both the vibratory movement that connects people right? Like if you, you can only vibe with, you can't just vibe, I feel like, right? You have to be in relation to, right? And, and that vibration is frequential to me, the extent to which it connects you to me, or what you were saying about the extent to which you recognize 
uh, something in Chief Keef, right? That's vibing with, right? Um, and it is also vibrational. And, and the frequency of that to me is, is about what you're saying about, um, the frequency is the frequency of shared denial, right? <laughs> that, that vibe then catches and transmits and you work with that. Um, so, so that's not going to the question of the body, that's going to the question of vibe and frequency, but I, maybe you have a better answer to the question of the body. I, I would, I would say um, a couple things. One is that often when I'm trying to think about this, I do end up thinking about um, of like bodily intensities, and I, I do end up kind of going back to questions of sex and sexuality in order to think through catching vibes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, but, but also just like more on a more conceptual plane, I, I think I've really been instructed by, um, by like Alexander Wahele's comments on, um, sort of certain kinds of the sonic components of self-making and mm. how this, that these, these, this kind of information is transmitted to us um you know um socially and historically right. um how do we come to know what an 808 means right dixon um will know what i'm talking about um and and i'm really interested in this quest <laughs> this question yeah. how 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 do you come to know what um sirens mean how do you come mm. to know what um what you know drill music which sort of uses all these sort of martial signals marching and you know how do you come to understand those as like able to move a room um you know and you know i i always wonder about the duration of vibes you know like how long? How long can a can a certain kind of sonic understanding be be transmitted? I think transmit is the right word. And you know, I actually don't think it's a purely sonic operation, right? It is. It's a highly, it's a highly um, linguistic operation through which we sort of communicate to one another the sensations, like blues. How can I? One of the reasons that I've come to sort of like disabuse myself of the notion that blues is a meaningful <laughs> way of talking about the way Black people understand sound is because I don't think we can actually um, continue to understand certain kinds of sonic information beyond a certain point. I mean, it's not being heard anymore. Mm -hmm. And so this is one of the reasons that, you know, like it's been really important to me to think about how younger writers like Ben, who works so beautifully with not only words, but also image and sound. Um, why do they do that? Like that was my initial question. Why do they do that? Uh, why do they need to do that? And, and what I found was they needed to do it because it was, part of, it was part of their understanding of who they were. They were no longer working with an understanding that their identity could be transmitted to others simply by telling people who or what they were. They actually had to go through a sonic demonstration, a, a, a visual demonstration, right? And at this kind of goes both ways across uh, the arts. You know, like you see all these young visual artists who, who are working in language because they recognize that they have to, in, or I believe that they, they recognize they have to in order to, to get traction, to not, and I don't mean art world traction. I mean that in order to fully convey, you know, the total vibration of their works, right? That they have to engage with these different kinds of formations, which are like giant cultural blobs, you know? Um, I wish Ben, I want Ben to, to talk a little bit about this vibes question because 
you know, one of the things that I asked Ben to do, I was like, just, can you, here I've written this thing, we've been talking about songs we like, what we, you know, what we're into. And I said, well, here I've written this thing. Can you insert yourself into this thing somehow? Which is a kind of catching a vibe, right? Right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, this is all great. and making me think about a lot. I feel on the one hand, Dixon's question about you know, the, the mechanism by which one catches a vibe has to do with the fact that the conditions are total and thus sublime in that sense. Um, and so not even the question of how things are mediated and received through media, but, you know, um, like as Christina Sharp says, the weather of anti-Blackness, I think, is, is a kind of sublimity as well in the sense that it's above and beyond my individual ability to sort of hold and understand it. Um, and so I think when it comes to the question of, you know, transference, uh, it has to do a lot with the kind of, um, it's an intervention in a certain sense that you sort of stop the mechanism for a second and pull things out of it um, and arrange them in a way. I um, mean, I think that has to do with the work I do in, in any medium, but that seems to me to be the active part of catching a vibe, whether it's you know through collaboration or through uh, the work on a specific project is that active component, which is to try to manage this kind of sublimity in a certain way. Um, yeah. Thank you all so much. I think I want to channel Ben your words as I say, there's an outside to the creative and critical work produced by Simone, Tina, and Ben, but not when you're in it. I thank you for delivering the register of rapture. I thank you for loosening all the constraints. I know that so many people who, are look, who have looked at you and listened to you in this last hour are feeling as I do, that they simply want to applaud you for delivering what, uh, Ben, you refer to as that precarious, right, production and performance. This precarious production and performance has been so tremendous. I know for me, I'm going to continue to think about so many of the registers of this rapture. Let me thank everyone for joining us today, everyone who we cannot see on the screen, and let me ask you to check out the website for University of Pennsylvania Center for Africana Studies because we have two other conversations that are part of this series. So please check out the websites in order to see the details, to get the details of these next conversations. And let us end by thanking once again, Simone White, Tina Camp, and Ben Cruzley. Thank you so much again. Good evening, everyone.